Hey, welcome to my Unit 2 review. This will be including Chapters 4 and 5 in the textbook, and it will be all about cells and their functions. Every living thing on Earth is made up of cells. The two types of cells are prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells are just old cells that have no nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles, and are super small. They do, however, have ribosomes. Every eukaryotic cell is way more complex and cooler. They contain a nucleus, MBOs, and make up all of the cells that aren't RK or U bacteria. Just remember, pro means no, no nucleus, no MBOs, and U means do. They do have a nucleus and MBOs. There are about 200 different kinds of cells in the human body. These cells are made up of smaller components called organelles. Each organelle has a specific function that helps divide up the tasks that are needed to be done and make everything in the cell more efficient. Now we're going to talk about the structure of a eukaryotic cell and specifically the subcellular components that make it up. And in order to make this a little easier to understand, we will be comparing a cell to a factory. And each organelle will be some part of that factory. Alrighty, so the first organelle we have here is the nucleus. And inside you can find the nucleolus. The nucleus's primary roles are to control the activity in the cell, store genetic material, and to determine what proteins the cell will produce. As you can see, it's surrounded by a double layer nuclear membrane perforated by nuclear pores and the envelope is continuous with the rough ER. All eukaryotic cells have nuclei. In our cell factory, this nucleus is going to be the CEO or the boss giving orders and being in charge of production. Next, we have the mitochondria. Found in both plants and animals, the mitochondria is responsible for producing the energy or ATP needed for the cell to do work through the process of cellular respiration. It is made up of a double membrane and folded inner membrane called cristae to increase surface area. We'll talk about why this is important later. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell factory. The cytoplasm is the gel-like substance that surrounds the organelles in the cell. It's also the site of most of the cellular activities, and the cytoplasm is basically the air in the factory that surrounds everything else. So we all know that something has to keep everything inside the cell, but actually the cell membrane serves a lot more uses than just that. The cell membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer and has proteins embedded within it that help regulate what enters or exits the cell. The membrane is also very important when the cell makes contact or receives signals from other surrounding cells. In a factory, the cell membrane could be the shipping or receiving department. In some cells, like plants and fungi, they're actually surrounded by a more rigid and thicker layer called the cell wall. The cell wall offers more protection and support than a cell membrane alone. The cell wall could be compared to a wall or a fence around a factory. And while we're looking at a plant cell, let's take a look at the chloroplasts. So chloroplasts are only found in plant cells, and the function of a chloroplast is to convert light energy into a sugar called glucose through a process called photosynthesis. The chloroplast consists of a double membrane, thylakoids and stacks called grana, a fluid called stroma, and a pigment called chlorophyll. The chloroplast would be like a solar panel turning solar energy into a usable form of energy for a plant. Now let's take a look at another organelle in any kind of eukaryotic cell, and that would be the endoplasmic reticulum, and there are two kinds. We have the smooth ER and the rough ER. The smooth ER has no ribosomes. Its job is to synthesize lipids, metabolize carbs, detox drugs and poisons, and to store calcium ions. The rough ER, on the other hand, is continuous with the nuclear envelope, surrounds the nucleus, and is covered in ribosomes. Its job is to package proteins for secretion and send transport vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. In the cell factory, the rough ER would be the worker-powered production line. And the smooth ER would be like an automated production line that does not require workers. These little guys that I'm about to place all around the cell are called ribosomes, and they can either be found on the rough ER or just floating around in the cytosol minding their own business. They're made up of a small and large subunit, and their job is to build the proteins. In a factory, ribosomes would be considered the workers. And next up, we have the Golgi body. And the Golgi body is a series of flattened sacs used for synthesis and packaging of materials to transport and the production of lysosomes. 
In a factory, the Golgi body would be like the finishing or packaging department. And the next organelles that we have are the lysosomes. The lysosomes are just membrane sacs of enzymes used to break down ingested substances, cell macromolecules, and damaged organelles. These are like the custodians who keep the factory clean and help recycle. The cytoskeleton is a microscopic network of protein filaments which gives the cell its shape and support. This could be like the beams in the walls of a factory holding it all together. Peroxisomes, last but not least, are small organelles similar to lysosomes, but the enzymes that they contain have a different function. These enzymes are typically used to detoxify various substances by creating hydrogen peroxide. Now that we're done with all those organelles, let's talk about cell size. A truth that seems to be pretty much fundamental for all units of AP biology is that structure determines function. This phrase is true across the board, whether we are referring to enzymes, cells, macromolecules, and so forth. Typically for cells, this means that the components that make up a cell determine what the cell is capable of. Another principle that we should know is that smaller cells are more efficient than larger cells. Information can be transported between smaller entities faster because traveling through a cell with a large volume takes a lot longer to reach its destination as shown here. And now we're finally on to my favorite part of this whole unit, the plasma membrane. <laughs> Had to write it real big for you. So as we discussed earlier, the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer with proteins, cholesterols, and carbohydrates scattered throughout. The structure of the membrane is fluid, so the positions of these things sort of shift around. And at low temperatures, the kinks in the phospholipids prevent close packing to maintain this fluidity and cholesterols actually help maintain this reasonable fluidity at high and low temperatures. So let's talk a little bit about this structure that we see here. A phospholipid is made up of two parts, hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. The heads are polar, so they will be attracted to the polar substances that surround the membrane. When the layers of the membrane are together, the tails face each other, and this causes the intersection of the membrane to be nonpolar. These regions of polarity and nonpolarity will act like a bouncer at a club. They'll let some kids in and keep others out. But instead of underage partiers, we're talking about molecules that the cell is trying to keep out. This property of a cell membrane is called semi-permeability. Another part of this fluid mosaic model is the proteins found along the cell membrane. These proteins have very many uses, some of which being transportation of large polar molecules, enzymatic activity, signal transduction, cell-to-cell -cell recognition, and so forth. The two types of proteins in the cell membrane are integral and peripheral proteins. If you integrate something, you insert or embed it, so integral proteins are embedded in the membrane. Your peripheral vision is just what you can see on the outskirts of your vision, so peripheral proteins are on either side of the membrane. That just helps me remember it. And finally, we have the carbohydrates, whose function is to help cells recognize each other. Specifically, carbs can be glycolipids or glycoproteins, and an example of these in action is the fact that blood receiving is specific to a certain type, so the blood recognizes what type it's receiving. Okay, so we discussed the membrane and what it's made of. We talked about the hydrophilic and hydrophobic areas, but let's explore a little bit into what it means for substances that are trying to enter or exit the cells. First, we'll talk about passive transport. In passive transport, small molecules pass through the membrane without the need for energy. Two examples of passive transport are diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Diffusion is a type of transport where molecules cross the membrane and follow the concentration gradient. Here we see the molecules are traveling from a high to low concentration. Osmosis is just the diffusion of water across the membrane in the same manner. Now facilitated diffusion is still passive transport. No energy is required. Molecules are still following the concentration gradient, but a transport protein is helping the hydrophilic substances cross, like ions and polar molecules. A specific example of these would be aquaporins, which allow the passage of water. Active transport, on the other hand, flows from a low to high concentration. This type of transport requires energy to overcome the concentration gradient. The most well-known example of active transport is the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump pumps sodium ions out of the cell and pumps potassium ions back into the cell. This generates a voltage across the membrane which helps the cell do work. Another type of active transport is bulk transport. 
where proteins, polysaccharides, large molecules, or even entire cells are transported in or out of the cell. In endocytosis, the membrane envelops the molecules and forms a new vesicle and as contents move into the cell. In exocytosis, it's just the opposite. The vesicles fuse with the membrane and contents are expelled out of the cell. As I mentioned before, the diffusion of water across a membrane is called osmosis. Osmosis and osmoregulation are very important for all kinds of cells because they control the solute and water balance to maintain homeostasis. There are three states that a cell can be in when it's in a solution. When the concentration of a solute is equal between the cell and its environment, the solution is considered isotonic to the cell. Water is flowing both in and out of the cell at constant rates, so the concentration stays the same. This is a blood cell in an isotonic solution, and this is a plant cell. In a hypertonic solution, the external environment has a higher solute concentration than the cell. Water will leave the cell to create a balanced concentration. In blood cells, this will cause the cell to shrivel, as pictured. In plant cells, the cell will plasmalize. In a hypotonic solution, the external environment has a lower solute concentration than the cell. Water will then enter the cell to create a balanced concentration. In blood cells, this will cause the cell to burst or lyse as pictured. In the plant cells, the cell does not lyse due to the cell wall, and this is the ideal condition for a plant cell. All right, so our last topic for this video is cell compartmentalization. Lization. There we go. And this is basically what it sounds like. It's the way organelles and eukaryotic cells work in separate areas to get the jobs done more efficiently. Being a cell is a hard job. There's a lot of things that need to be done in order to keep the organism alive. Before cells evolved to be this way, back in the days where everything was prokaryotic, cells typically could only perform one task at a time. This was very inefficient. So what cells have done over time is they have evolved where now they can perform multiple tasks at once because multiple organelles are active at the same time. The endosymbiotic theory is that current theory of how membrane-bound organelles became a thing. Yeah. This theory believes that ancient prokaryotic cells actually engulfed another cell. These cells began to work together and eventually they believe that the engulfed cell has become what we know to be either the mitochondria or the chloroplast or really any other membrane-bound organelle. Evidence for this theory extends from the fact that the mitochondria and the chloroplast have a double membrane, maybe from when they were engulfed by the original cells. In addition to this, mitochondria and chloroplast have their own DNA and are able to reproduce alone. Isn't that kind of crazy? <laughs> Alright, that is all for Unit 2, Chapters 4 through 5. Thank you for watching and be sure to drop a like and subscribe. See you all next time and have a great Christmas.